Um, hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the lunch. Um, yeah, from experience, I know half of you have not been to KubeCon before, but for those of you who maybe went to KubeCon EU this year, the food, it wouldn't have been hard to improve on the food from KubeCon EU. So, uh, and actually, I really enjoyed my lunch, so hopefully the rest <coughs> of you did too. Um, I'm actually going to hand over to Tiago, who's one of the committee here. Um, he's he's going to talk a little bit about like the, the shirts that he brought to give out um, and a bit about like you know trying to encourage and embrace like diversity and um, global representation in, in tech. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, what about playing stand up, sit down once again? Uh, everybody, uh, stand up uh, and sit down. Uh, how many of you folks were born and raised in Europe? Can you please sit down? Uh, how many of uh, how many of you folks were born and raised in Asia and Pacific? Uh, how many of you folks were born and raised in America? How many of you folks were born and raised in Latin America? How many of you folks live outside Latin America? Geographical diversity matters. Uh, so this is a, uh, this t-shirt that I brought for you folks uh, as a part of the giveaway. Uh, it's a token of appreciation. Uh, I know how tough it is to make it to the tech industry without proper as access to knowledge and resources. Uh, this jersey is from a minor league soccer team from my blue collar neighborhood. My father used to be a, trucker, a truck driver. Uh, every time I wear this t-shirt, it reminds me how hard it is in some regions to achieve their goals. In Brazil, you either uh, become a soccer player or a uh, soap opera star. Uh, it's quite the same in Latin America whenever you stay there. Uh, it also reminds me the importance of giving back to the community. Thank you very much. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day. Amazing, yeah, thank, thank you, Tiago. Um, okay, so uh, our next um, talk is gonna be, uh, well, the title is Feather, an open source, battle-tested, scalable, and enterprise-grade feature store. I imagine if you wanted a feature store, those four things are definitely things you'd be looking for. Um, but the, uh, I think that, you know, the cool thing with Feather is this was built like at a, a company that already has lots of scale and has been dealing with this for five years now. So um, this has come out of LinkedIn and Hang Fei Lin is going to talk to us about that. He's a staff software engineer at LinkedIn. So let's please give him a round of applause and welcome him. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Hang Fei and uh, a staff software engineer at LinkedIn. Um, today, I'm really happy to be here to share our work and the progress on AI infra on Kubernetes AI day. Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, self-introduction for myself. Uh, I joined LinkedIn about uh, seven years. Uh, in the first three years, I work on like building microservices and building data pipelines. And later on, uh, I switched to machine learning infra and focus on building feature store in the last uh, four years. And I like system design and the product design. And I also like to hear users' feedback about the, our product and the users uh, conduct user study and understand their pain points and build a product or solution for them. So if you have pain points in this uh, area, uh, I'm happy to talk to you. So with that, I will uh, maybe give a very brief introduction about the Feather. Feather is an open source, enterprise-grade, high-performance feature store. It was built at LinkedIn about like five years ago. And since then, we have uh, um, uh, adopted by a lot of uh, uh, a majority of AI teams and AI applications at LinkedIn and uh, powering a lot of AI applications. And uh, in this April, we have made it open source, uh, collaborating with Azure, and now it's integrated into Azure Cloud. And now in this uh, uh, September, uh, we have, uh, it has been accepted by Linux Foundation and AI data as a sandbox, a sandbox project. 
So um, Feature Store is both old and new. Uh, we have been developing Feature Store, I think, about five years. But there are still uh, companies kind of just start to consider adopting Feature Store or thinking about if they should use Feature Store. And uh, every year, there are new solutions uh, with different kind of angle trying to tackle this problem. And uh, trying to tackle this problem. So I feel it's important to share our view and uh, our view on how do we formulate this problem and what problem we have seen and how those problems lead to this solution we have built here. Um, so agenda today will be problem statement, solution, and architecture, and roadmap, and uh, demo, uh, if we have time. So I think a little bit of background here, most people might be familiar with it. So AI industry is really growing in this last decade. Uh, a lot of AI uh, applications like GPT-3 and or stable diffusion to generate AI-generated content and many other usage to help to people to build better AI applications. And I believe AI will keep improving people's life in this century and disrupt many other industries. And the demand is really growing exponentially. So is the demand for ML ops and ML infra. So in the past, people have paid more attention to models, but less attention to like data and the feature. Like the presenter in the first keynote mentioned, there is a shift uh, from model-centric AI towards like data-centric AI. So for data-centric AI, right, most people start to pay attention to like unstructured data, like image, text, and so on. And yeah. And uh, also uh, some industry also start to pay attention to like structured and semi-structured data like uh, user interaction data, uh, like user, uh, user static information data, and so on. And, and we also see a trend that people are shifting towards using more real-time features and building more real-time inferences. So the goal for, the goal for features is Usually people want higher quality. They want the data to be, feature to be more correct without any data leaks and so on. And they want the feature to be more performant. Like either like for offline, they want high throughput or like low latency for online inference. And they want to have like a faster iteration. Like AI application uh, building is really iterative process. The faster you can iterate, the faster you can bring more impact. And lastly, uh, the importance of fresher feature uh, is kind of pr more prominent over time. A lot of applications uh, requires more, like more fresher feature, like uh, Netflix and uh, TikTok. Uh, for example, if you uh, somebody viewed a, a comedy, comedy movie, it's likely they might they might want to view another comedy movie uh, today. It might not be very not very reasonable to recommend a horror movie or something. And this is more kind of outstanding in TikTok. If you view something, you might be view another related stuff later on. So, but how does that go fit into uh, production or reality, right? This is actually uh, one of our open source users asked me, okay, I'm new to this industry. How do I actually featureize my raw data for my applica AI applications? So taking a typical example, like you have a website and you have user activity data coming in. And usually uh, you will have like a checking events to collect those data and while uh, streaming like a Kafka and uh, send those data into offline storage like uh, uh, data lake. And, uh, data lake. and part, part of that data will be sent into uh, online database. The typical path people usually do, like for training is, uh, or in offline inferences, just go through the offline database. Those are very mature, mature kind of a process and a workflow. But when it comes to like uh, online and the streaming, it uh, becomes relatively harder due to the complexity of uh, topology. And it usually takes quite some time for a company or a team to make all the features available in different uh, scenarios like streaming, online, and offline. 
So this is from a, that is from a technical perspective. Let's look at like a human human side, human perspective. This is a survey done done by Forbes, asking people about how much time do you spend, uh, asking about AI engineers and the data scientists, how much time do they spend on like uh, data cleaning, uh, prepar preparing their data, build their training data set, and uh, uh, tuning their algorithms. 82% of the their time actually spent on data preparation. And 76% actually don't really enjoy the lowest part of work. It's usually kind of uh, tedious. So I actually also surveyed like our uh, internal like data scientists or AI engineers and some of our, uh, my friends from other areas or our users about a similar question. Like how much, uh, how much uh, is your data, uh, how much time do you spend on uh, uh, about feature engineering related tasks, uh, including feature serving, feature data cleaning, apart from model. And uh, in average, they spend like 40% time on this task. And most of them all, uh, don't really enjoy those uh, type of work, essentially. They enjoy like feature engineering itself, but they don't enjoy like maybe how to serve the feature online uh, and how to clean those data and how to make sure the data quality is good and monitoring and so on. So it's really hard, it's really hard to convert raw data into features and then serve into models. It's pretty complex, involves many steps and different tools, and it involves heterogeneous environments, offline, online, and near line. And they have different requirements actually for different use cases and the systems. And on the organization level, like or like a team level, it usually demands uh, different uh, vast experience and uh, multiple skills and uh, different uh, knowledge. And when you start to build an AI team, and uh, as it scales, you will find that a lot of tribal knowledge actually for doing things around the feature related task. So in some company, usually it's either one person like do this end to end, like do most of the stuff, or in other company, maybe there will be a part of a team that do this together. So data scientists may just focus on very small part of things. They will just uh, be focusing on building the prototype. And after the prototype is done, they will hand it over to other teams. So this is another model. So I think this, this model sometimes leads to this kind of meme here. Okay, once they are done, they just hand it over and they don't care about what happens for the rest of it. And then there will be complaints from the data ops team for sure. So, and lastly, I think it's equally like, people don't like to jump from one tool to the other. This is not really fun. So this is a problem statement uh, we, I kind of uh, sum summarize here based on those observations. There's a couple in here, people usually just couple their feature engineering into model, just a whole big pipeline of one whole big notebook to achieve all of them. And then, and then there's a, like training and the inference skill. And training data and the inference uh, data might, might not be the same and result in a skill later on. And there's an organization like a organization problem as well. It becomes hard to reuse and share your features across your teams or across your organizations later on. So there we have raw data on one side and the, we wanted to make it into features and to serve into model for model inference. I feel there's apparently there's something is missing here. There's a gap that we need to fill. So that leads me to this question. Um, can we build a layer to simplify this? So that enters our solution here. So feature store. I think a feature store, um, for some people, uh, this might be confusing sometimes because actually I think this is not a well standardized terms. In some, some, some kind of marketing uh, material, people will define it in a narrow way. It just means the storage system that store the feature data itself. Uh, for example, like Redis feature store. Or like Google has this tensor store, it's mostly for offline training purposes. People call it a feature store as well. 
There's also like a broad definition, like a feature, is like a feature management system that allows you to create, access, and share, and discover features. It usually composed of an ecosystem of a tool set, essentially. This is also the definition used by Wikipedia. So Fellow Feature Store is more like on a broader sense. It's a feature management system. So it's better tested at LinkedIn for five years. And we are not opinionated about what feature storage system you use. You can plug in like Redis or Aerospike or Cosmos DB or S3 and so on. And right now it's open source and it's now a linear with foundation AI and the data sandbox project. So further from very high level, further is an abstraction layer between raw data and the model. It helps you to define features based on raw data uh, raw data sources using simple APIs. Get those features uh, by their names during model training and the model inference. This will avoid the problem like for the just training serving skill. It allows, it allows you to share features across your team and organization. So I will demonstrate some uh, use cases and examples to give you a kind of a hands-on experience of how it's like. So further started with like uh, further started with like uh, feature definitions for AI, uh, AI engineers and data scientists. For example, here you have a New York taxi trip uh, data that consists of like uh, pick up time and drop off time and some trip distance information in your database in your data lake in CSV format. So then you can just describe uh, what's the path to that data and the timestamp. The timestamp is mostly used for like something called a point in time drawing to prevent the data leak. Uh, we might not have time to call that today, but if we have time, we can call that in an example later on. But if you have time, uh, if the data is time sensitive, you can just tell us like the timestamp and the layer format. Then you can just tell us the key and put the key, give it a description of it. And then for features, you can, if the feature is, is already kind of featureized, then you can just take out as is like for trip distance. For, and an, another example, if you want to transform your raw data into another different feature, you can use that using like a SQL or Python as well. For here, we use a SQL to say, okay, if this is a long trip distance. And lastly, you just group them into together into a feature anchor. So feature anchor is, means like a, a few features that anchor to a specific source. So this is kind of a, you define your first two features here for one source. And the next one is about, a, you can do the same thing for streaming feature as well. Uh, it's mostly the same. The only difference is like for Kafka source, you have to tell us like brokers and the topics and the schema. And then the rest of the ideology is actually pretty the same. So it can be transfer, uh, it's unified API can be transferable from one platform to the other. So after you have defined the features, then you can use the defined features in different uh, use cases and the scenarios. For this one, we, uh, let's talk about the most common one, like build a training data set. So to build a training data set, you just need to tell us the observation data set. Observation data set usually contains the label for your training. And if it's a time sensitive uh, observation data, you should tell us the timestamp as well so that we can help you to join the feature in a point in time correct way. So later on, you can just tell us the features you want. For example, here, you, uh, we, I want like a location average fair. And then lastly, you can just uh, call get offline features with the above metadata you provided. Then we will, fellow engine will kick off the computer in the cluster you, you chosen. So that we can, the features will be computed uh, later on. So after model is trained, you may want to uh, serve your models in the, uh, uh, serve your models, right? Serving model offline is uh, relatively easy right now, but sometimes serving a model in online setting is relatively harder. So to do that, uh, to serve features here, usually the easiest way here in Feather is you just push that data into Redis here. So you can just uh, uh, specify the table you want to push to. 
and then tell us what features you need. And then you can just call the materialized features, and we can kick off an offline computer job for you and push the features to online Redis. Usually after like a, a few minutes, you can get the data in a Redis, and you can call this in your online inference uh, cluster to do the online inference. We also, we also provide a UI to help your team to help to discover and uh, to share features. Here you can find the all search for your features you are interested. And also we provide a lineage uh, metadata information to understand what feature is derived from, from what and uh, uh, what uh, is derived from what source as well. So we also, uh, for enterprise need, we know like a lot of times uh, access control is pretty uh, critical as well. So we provide access control as well. You can specify what team members or what teams see what uh, project essentially. They can have read, write, or uh, manage control. So lastly, we also provide a derived feature. Sometimes you want to have capability to do feature cross, like one feature multiplied by the other feature, or like in this example, you want to compute the embedding cosine similarity between two embeddings. So you can say user embedding and item embedding. And uh, multiply that, uh, you can use like our function, function called like science similarity to multiply by user embedding by item embedding to produce a similarity score. So oh, yeah, we invest a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, our time on scalability, like in linking, our scale is pretty huge. So we find actually if we don't do any scalability optimization, uh, it's pretty hard to co com uh, complete the job to create a training data set. So either sometimes it runs like many, many days, sometimes it even doesn't finish. So we have invested a lot to make uh, processing like tens of billions of rows and the petabyte scale data possible. We build optimi uh, native optimizations like Bloom filters, drawing plan optimiza optimizations and the sorted drawing to make that possible. Also, we have cloud-friendly architecture that each individual component can scale out as it needs. Security is also one thing we care about a lot. So we have like a security a credential manager and a keyword manager, a keyword to help you to store credentials, to help your team to manage the credential in a secure way. So there is a, like a RBAC we just made, we just demonstrated uh, there to help you to control the access as well. So let's like revisit this diagram again. So this is like in practice, in the real world, what you have to do, like there are a lot of branches, different scenarios if you want to featureize, access or manage your features in different scenarios for offline, nearline or online fashion. So I highlighted these like components in orange if you want to build kind of a mature featureization platform or pipeline. So those are the components you need to build. Based on our experience, uh, if you want to build a, like a production grade, mature kind of virtualization platform or pipeline, you usually may take, each of them may take like a few quarters of engineering hours. So, and apart from that, you have to think about other like components to support your ecosystem, like discoverability, shareability, and the monitoring, and uh, compliance, and so on. So each of them may take actually quite a significant time and, and investment. So with Fela, uh, we are trying to say, uh, build a good abstraction to abstract away those uh, infrastructure details from your AI engineers, from your manager management teams, and so on. So your data scientist team can just use our API to achieve what they want using either SQL or Python. And, uh, and also using AI, uh, UI to discover the features and share their features. And for some like managers or administrative like uh, staff, they can also use AI to achieve certain tasks they want. 
So here, um, I want to talk about the failure at linking, like history, present, and, the layer, and its impacts. So we started initial development in 2017. And uh, in 2018, uh, we started adoption within linking. And in 2020, we have achieved the majority of linking MRO application adoption. And in 2022, we make it open source and uh, have a great Azure collaboration and also integrated into Azure. And then we, we are now a part of like a Linear Foundation AI data sample box project. And we also have like people uh, using, using Fela in AWS as well. Right now, we, uh, Fela is powering hundreds of AI models at LinkedIn, thousands of features, and in many kinds of entities that empower our LinkedIn's economic growth. It runs at a petabyte scale. So these are several kind of highlights, uh, highlighted like impacts I want to mention here. The first one is reducing the feature engineering time required to adding and experimenting and serving features in the production from weeks to days. In the past, it usually requires a lot of people and the time to actually build pipelines or build integration code or build applications to actually put features into production. There are a lot of details that you need to worry about, like point-in-time drawing and the performance and the latency, and how do you call a large amount of data without causing GC problems and so on. And the second is related, like we, we actually find actually further performance faster than some, some custom build uh, feature processing pipeline, sometimes by as much as 50%. And Fela also enables feature sharing between similar applications. Like for example, you have a feature for your member or a feature for your job. And the other team is building similar kind of uh, AI applications, but with a slightly different variation. You can just use Fela and just call that feature name and we can help you to orchestrate all the artifacts for you without too much hassle. So next I will talk about uh, architecture and, uh, and the roadmap. So this is uh, like end-to-end -end workflow for the Azure integration. The, 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 on the left top side is the AI engineers or data scientists they come in. Usually they will start with interacting with the UI to understand what features has already been created in the, uh, in the system. And uh, this is powered by RESTful API and the Purview and the SQL as their data backends. And we have a Python, a fellow Python client to help you to create, manage, and uh, define feature definitions. After you, you after the data scientists create those, then they can dispatch, a uh, fellow engine will dispatch those computers to the corresponding uh, compute cluster, like a Spark or Synapse. They will talk to like the offline storage Delta Lake or Snowflakes and so on. And uh, we also can talk to like Kafka and Event Hub. Also for online server, we can push the data to like Redis and the Cosmos DB. This can later be on, be used by uh, machine learning platforms. So uh, due to time constraint, I will uh, not cover the roadmap in a lot of details. Uh, maybe I will just skip it and have more time for, yeah, uh, have some time for summary here. Fela is an open source feature store which can be seen as an abstraction layer between raw data and the model. Fela allows you to define features with transformation on top of raw data source and get feature values by, uh, by name during both training and inferencing. Fela also simplifies feature preparation workflows and enable feature sharing across teams and uh, even organizations. So we don't have time for demo, but there's a link if you are interested, you, you can open it to try it out. This is a product recommendation like in your e-commerce website. And lastly, do we still have time for Q&A? Yeah, we still have time for a couple. Yeah, maybe we can take some questions here. Thank okay. you. Yep, round of applause. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Heng Fei. Um, yeah, great talk. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Just stick up your hand and I'll come over. Yeah, there we go. Someone at the back. Can you talk a bit about configuration? Oh. 
Sorry, can I get you to sit in here so people online can hear? Uh, could you please talk a little bit about your compute engine? Uh, is, it, is it all Spark? Yeah, uh, the question is uh, about the computer engine we use. I think that's a great question. And uh, the computer engine right now, we are mostly using Spark. Yeah. Great. Um, any others? We're back here. Yep. Yeah, I have a question about the RBAC control. So uh, is the RBAC can be integrated with the, like the company's uh, uh, directory or, or how it's integrated with the real like, case, or, or do we just manage it within the, um, like the, the feeder context or not? Yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. Uh, the RBAC right now is uh, integrated mostly based on Azure kind of uh, 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 access control. But uh, we have an abstraction layer actually, it's just kind of a key value pair. You can replace that into different uh, ex uh, uh, kind of a identity management system. Uh, for example, we have a, a, a user that is actually using this in AWS. So we are working with them to make this available in AWS. Great, um, any final questions? Yeah, there's one more here and then we'll, we'll wrap up on that. Uh, when you did transformations earlier, do you support geospatial type transformations, being able to say something's within a certain radius of a point or within a certain bounding box? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Do you support geospatial type attributes? You mean geospatial transformations or yeah. just the data types? Both. Uh, okay. Uh, we don't natively support like geospatial specific data types, but we support a very kind of rich data types from like a one dimension tensor to multiple dimension tensors as well. And uh, for transformations, uh, you can plug in the transformation you like as long as it's SQL based or it's Python based. So I know like a lot of uh, geospatial libraries are Python based. You can likely to plug in Python based, uh, Python based uh, geo, uh, geospatial transformations. And what you have to do is just you need to include your dependencies and we will help you to download those dependencies when the computer runs. Great, right, well, um, yeah, thanks again. Let's have a, a round of applause for Hang Fei Lin. Thank you.